Praise your name, Lord. I want to talk a little bit today on the resurrection, on our resurrection. It's just been an interesting topic that has come up recently in some fellowships, looking at the actual physical resurrection of Jesus, and then our own resurrection. And uh, I'm just going to start right here in Acts, because I think this, this is important, and I pray that we have the understanding that Jesus did rise as a physical being, clothed with the fullness of divinity, the Spirit, from heaven. When he came forth from that tomb, I had done a, a, a video, I think the last year, on uh, b- beginning looking at the resurrection of Jesus and, um, and how he was a new creation when he came forth from the tomb. So I, mean, I want to jump into Axel, just a little bit of time here today. Um, now this is Peter. This is Peter talking at, on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit had fallen and he was revealing truth to those who had come. And Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, and that's another whole study, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it were not possible that he should be held by it. For David said concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption." You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Praise your name. Let's continue um, before I delve into this a little bit. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So they knew where David's body was, that he was buried, that he had not been raised. He was not speaking of himself. Therefore, verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore having Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from him, I'm sorry, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. That was in in, um, reference to Joel's prophecy. Uh, Verse 34, For David did not not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, he's talking about the man Jesus. That's who they knew. Those in that region at that time who had, who had come in contact with him, had been healed by him, had been taught by Jesus. They knew he was a man. He was a physical man. His flesh did not see corruption in the grave. That physical body was raised. We know when... Uh, When Peter and John went to the tomb after the resurrection, when Mary had come and said that that he's gone, and they didn't know where he is, they went and found an empty tomb. They did not go in there and see a body and just believe that Jesus had been raised as a spirit. It was now alive spiritually, but his body was still there dead physically. Praise your name. I've, uh, I've had some contact me recently and are trying to explain to me that that Jesus' resurrection was spiritual and not physical. And even when I asked, well, what happened to the body? They, they told me it doesn't matter. That Jesus is now a spirit like his father and the angels in the heavens. And that um, it, it doesn't matter what, what happened to his body. But he wasn't raised uh, physically, they say, because there's a scripture that tells us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. And we know this is true and we believe it. But yet Jesus was flesh and bone when he appeared after his resurrection. And the Apostle John says, our hands have handled him. 
So they, they knew he was raised a physical human being, but fully clothed now with the divine, the fullness of God. He was the convergence of the physical and spiritual realms, the firstborn. Praise your name. I'm getting ahead of myself again, like I always do. Oh, praise your name, Lord. So this physical resurrection of Jesus is, is the hope. In fact, where is it? Um, in 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul really gets into this. So we just read what Peter said. Now, And, and, we, and we know what Jesus said to the, the disciples when he appeared to them. He said, when they thought he was a spirit, he said, flesh, he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. And he had Thomas reach into his side and touch the nail prints in his hands, his physical hands. Jesus did not rise as a spirit being and in some sort of a, a physical form for a time. No, he was raised in a physical body, clothed with the spiritual divinity of God. Praise your name. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians, and he talks about this. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead which they were preaching, his physical body had been raised, the Christ, Jesus, the man Jesus, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. So Paul is saying that they would be lying if they said that the Christ had been raised physically from the dead and was the firstborn from the dead. If they were preaching that, but it hadn't happened, then they would be found to be liars. Verse 16, But if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And he touches on this a little bit because there were those back then who were, they were um, being baptized and said for the dead. There was some, I, I don't, we don't believe in that today, but they recognized that because some had died before Jesus had been resurrected, they were concerned for their relatives. So they were, they were, doing some sort of ceremony or whatever to be baptized for them so that that, so that that relative of theirs whom they loved, who had perished before Jesus had been raised, that they wanted them to be raised physically as well in that day of, of the resurrection because Jesus taught the resurrection from the dead. Um, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, when, when he raised Lazarus, um, when even that wasn't an eternal resurrection because Lazarus died again after that. Praise your name. Um, continuing in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Again, Jesus is the first one, the firstborn of the dead, the firstborn of creation, the firstborn of many brothers. There's others to come after him in the same like manner as he was raised. Praise your name. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. It doesn't say spirit or divine being, or anything else that says man. And that's talking about physical flesh and bone man. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his order. Christ, the firstfruits. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's physical death. That's what's going to be destroyed, is physical death. No more death, sorrow, or crying, says Revelation. 27. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, talking about the Christ, it is evident that he who put all things under him, the Father, is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That gets off into another topic, um, and I've been debating some on, on this idea uh, of a trinity, of a co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal Godhead where the three are in one. This refutes that entirely. It puts a complete end to that, because we see that, that the Son, Jesus, 
uh, Christ is going to be subject always to the Father. The Father is greater than him. Jesus had said this. There's many, many passages, numerous passages, that show the relationship between the Father and the Son, and they are not one in that sense that we teach. Praise your name. Because he's also called his elect to be one with him as he is one with the Father. So that, that's another topic. I'll get caught up on that. I do often. Um, I'm going to get back to this resurrection, though. So Jesus was raised as a physical being, fully human and fully divine. The convergence, that's the understanding we don't seem to have um, in large part in the churches today, is that the two realms are going to converge. And they began that convergence when Jesus came out of the tomb on that resurrection morning, on Easter morning. Praise your name. Oh, praise your name. Um, and then farther down, uh, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, a wonderful chapter. Um, and this is from the, the Lexham version, uh, starting at verse 40. Oh, Lord, I can't see where I go in my eyes anymore. 42. Thus also is the resurrection of the dead. Because they're asking, how are the dead going to be raised? It is sown in corruption. It is raised in corruptibility. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in... A natural body is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And this is where some get off and believe, okay, we were a natural body once, now we're going to be a spiritual body. But when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we recognize that our, our natural body, our physical body, is going to be clothed with that spiritual body. And Paul says that we desire not to be unclothed, which means to come out of our our physical body, but to be further clothed so that these physical frames that are raised up in that day are going to receive from, this, from the heavens that spiritual body that we have sown to in this life. Praise your name. Thus it is also written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, made of, made of earth. The second man, again man, is from heaven. As the one who is from earth, or is made of earth, so also are those who are made of earth. And as the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the one who is made of earth, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. We shall appear with him as he is in that day. Jesus was the firstborn among, among many brethren who are being conformed into his image. Praise your name. And here's the verse that, that, that is used, um, not recognizing that the blood is, is going to be gone. It's going to be replaced by the spirit driving the life force of man. But I say this, brothers, the flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruptibility. Behold, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In the moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. Again, this is the dead being raised. So that which was dead is coming to life. It's not just a spirit. It's the physical bodies coming up. Jesus said that all those will come out of the tombs. Your spirit doesn't come out of the tomb. Only your body can come out of the tomb. Praise your name. We saw that type with Lazarus coming forth from the tomb. His physical body came out. His spirit didn't come out. His physical body emerged. Praise your name. And we will be changed. For it is necessary for this perishable body to put on incorruptibility and this mortal body to put on immortality. Not be replaced, but put it on. And immortality, that's the goal, friends. And I've been in some discussions with some good brothers on this as well. Adam, the first Adam, did not have immortality in his body. He could have, if he would have not partaken of the tree of the, of the um, knowledge of good and evil, but partaken of the tree of life. And that, that's, again, that's an, even another study. Praise your name, Lord. But immortality, once we are immortal, there's, we can no longer die. Jesus is now immortal. That physical Jesus that is clothed with the spiritual, who is sitting now at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. He is immortal. He can no longer die. We'll look at that in a moment, perhaps, in, in Romans 6. Uh, back to um, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, uh, 54. But whenever this perishable body 
puts on incorruptibility and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Then, death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? This mortal body is going to put on immortality. Again, it's not going to be set aside and become something um, completely different. It's going to be clothed with. It's going to be made new. These physical bodies, friends, and I fully believe this, and I, I, I appreciate any, any interaction, any, any discussion, different points of view on this, and we can discuss this, because I believe this is important. I believe this was the blessed hope of the church. Um, the first century disciples was that they were going to be raised in their physical bodies. And we'll see throughout Acts, Paul teaches the resurrection, our physical resurrection from the dead, as well as Jesus. It has to begin with Jesus. If Jesus has not been raised in a physical body, then there is no hope for us. What is our hope? And I know what's been taught, and I, I, I've heard it, I've been in assemblies where it's taught that when a physical person dies and, and, we, and we, we, we lay them in the tomb, that their spirit is now resurrected in the heavens, and, they're, and that's, that's their glorified body. But there's no scripture for that. That defeats the entire purpose. Jesus did not leave his body here on earth and ascend into the heavens. And if we are, the promise is that we will be like him. The disciples saw Jesus, his physical body, rise up into the cloud. It was received into the cloud. And the angel told them, he said, as you have seen him go into heaven, you will see him return in the same way. Oh, Jesus. Death is not our resurrection. If we died physically and our resurrection was just in heaven in a spiritual body, and at this, besides not even fitting in the scripture, that leaves no hope. It, 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 in my understanding, my belief of what the scripture says, that would leave us without hope. Because that was the goal, even of Job. Where is that? Job. I was just looking at that earlier. In Job chapter 19. And even all the stuff that Job was experiencing, his desire was not to leave his fleshly body, which was plagued with illness and disease. And, and, this, and there's a sorrow of seeing his family killed and all his possessions stripped from him. His desire was not to just become a spirit and float up into heaven. No, what he said was, bah, bah, bah. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth, the physical earth, the Lord Jesus. Even then, he was expecting to see the Lord's Christ, Messiah, appear standing physically on the earth. Verse uh, 26, Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh... I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. That was his desire. The cry of Job was that with his physical eyes, in his flesh, he would see God on the earth. His Redeemer coming, returning to the earth to restore creation back to what it was. Yes, his flesh saw corruption in the tomb. For a time. But God is going to raise it up again. Job had this understanding. We can see in other, there's a few other references. They're not as blatant as we would like, but they're in the, they're in the Old Testament. And Isaiah, I think chapter 26, also talks about um, the bodies being uh, raised. I'll put the reference down below when I find it. Praise your name. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus did not see corruption. Job recognized that his, his skin would be destroyed. But we know from the prophecy of, of David, from the Psalms, we just read it here in, um, in Acts 2, you will not leave his soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, the, it, It's the body that gets corrupted. It's the skin that perishes. But the body is going to rise again. These physical frames, God is going to bring them back together. I know old Brother Thompson used to say, even if an atom bomb falls on your head, and, and you're disintegrated, God's able to bring your molecules back together, and you will stand in your physical bodies before him in that day. When, when, again, when Jesus um, says, I, when they hear the voice, they will come forth from the tombs uh, unto, the, unto the resurrection of life or the resurrection of condemnation. 
depending on what we've done in these physical bodies. We're going to receive, in fact, it says again in 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to receive in our bodies what we've done in our bodies, what we've sown. Uh, Galatians 6, if we've sown unto corruption, we're going to reap corruption. We're not going to put on these incorruptible, immortal bodies if we've sown unto corruption in our flesh. But if we've sown unto the Spirit, we're going to reap that eternal life, that incorruptible, immortal, eternal life, and be and become life-giving spirits in a flesh and bone body to minister to creation. Praise your name. It's like again, Paul. Paul talked about the physical resurrection when he uh, uh, when he was being accused by the Pharisees for teaching a uh, what they thought was a heresy because they because he taught that Jesus was the Messiah, um, and he stood before Felix, the the governor of um, of uh, Samaria, um, in Acts twenty four, and Paul said, "But this I confess to you." That according to the way, capital W, uh, the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept. Now he's talking about the Pharisees. They believe this also. They didn't believe Christ was the Messiah, but they believe the thing written in the law and the prophets, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So what Paul is saying here, and he was taught, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed that everyone was going to be raised from the dead at some point. The good, the evil, the bad, the ugly, they were all going to be raised, and then they'd be judged accordingly. What the Pharisees didn't believe was that, was that the Messiah was Jesus Christ, the man who had come forth, who they had seen walking in the streets, in the appearance of a man, eating, drinking, having dirty feet, and uh, sleeping, being tired, a physical man that did not come as a king, as a conqueror, like they expected him to. He is going to return in such manner, but he had to come this way first and be the, and be the propitiation for our sins. He had to be tested and tried, perfected on the earth through suffering and obedience to the Father. And he was made Lord in Christ and given all authority after his resurrection. And he's going to return as they expected him to back then to restore the kingdom to Israel, restore creation to God. So Paul was preaching to Christ. They could not accept that. But they were on the same page, understanding there is a physical resurrection. Oh, praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, let me go to uh, Romans 6 a little bit here. Oh, Jesus. And there was an understanding, apparently, and I think this from some of the Gnostic belief that that the spirit is good and the body is evil, and and then when Paul came preaching the grace of God, some were twisting that into well, it doesn't really matter what I do with my body, because the body's evil, it's going to go into the grave anyway, and our spirits are going to rise to 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 meet God in in the spirit realm, that the grace of God was going to cover what our physical bodies did. And because they were going to perish, it didn't matter if we continued in sin because the grace and forgiveness of God covered that. There's a lot of that in our Christian churches today, um, in the religion, that, that kind of teaches that grace covers everything in, in, in a way that God can't see what we do. No, we're going to be held accountable for the things that, that we do in our body. That's throughout the entire scripture, and Jesus taught that specifically as well. Praise your name. But anyway, beginning of, of Romans chapter 6. And he says, so, uh, so what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Um, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now we died to sin. In, in, if we have been baptized into the death of Christ, then we've been, been crucified to this, to sin's dominion over us. We no longer have to sin. We haven't physically died in this sense here, but we've died to sin. And he, and he continues in verse 3, or, or do you not know, I don't think many of us understand this today, that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. And I believe this corresponds, because uh, Paul's talking to the saints here, I believe this corresponds with uh, John chapter 5, verses 24 to 27, 
which talks about we can walk in the resurrection life of Christ now, before the general resurrection when everybody comes forth in the tombs. So even in our physical bodies, now, before our physical death, we can walk in the resurrection life of Jesus now, because we're sowing to that. That in that day, after we do die physically and we're raised at the first resurrection, we'll receive that immortal, incorruptible body from the spirit realm that will clothe this natural man and we shall be made like Christ in his image, one with him as he is one with the Father. Praise your name. Verse 5, for if we have been united, and again, if, this is a massive thing that we continually overlook, I believe. These are, there's conditions on all the promises of God. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, if we've allowed ourselves to die to sin's dominion, to death's dominion over us, praise your name. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's what our baptism is, our baptism. And we do it symbolically in the water, but in reality, our, our whole life is a baptism, friends. I, I've been threatening to do a, a, a teaching on that and, and looking into Ezekiel 47 and um, in John chapter uh, 6 and some other places on what our baptism is. And it's into his death. is dying to our old nature. Our physical bodies, we're in these now. And God is, is birthed in us, the seed, his seed, that is the Christ that we're supposed to be nurturing in these physical bodies, sowing to the Spirit that we may reap life in that day. But we're supposed to be dead to sin. We're supposed to put to death the deeds of the, of, of the flesh, of the body, by the Spirit. Praise your name. Uh, so it's done away with. They're no longer slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now that's not physical death. That's talking about dying in our baptism with Christ so that we're freed from sin's dominion over us. So now, when we sin, friends, this, we're, we're making the choice. We're allowing ourselves to sin. We're sowing unto corruption. Oh, Jesus. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, again, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. This is in mortality. This is talking about the physical body again, because Jesus the Christ was raised from the dead and he cannot die. This means he died once. Now we know his, the, the word didn't die. The word of God didn't die. And again, this shows us the separation between, between God the Father and Jesus the Son. And they're not the same. Because God did not die. God never died. If God died, there would be no more existence for any of us. So the man Jesus died. But he was raised from the dead. He is unable to die now. He was raised immortal. That's the promise. And Romans 2 talks about this as well for those who are seeking immortality. Oh, Jesus, praise your name. Death no longer has dominion over him. Death has dominion over us. If we're, if we're remaining in our sinful flesh and sowing to that, death has dominion over us. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what we're to practice. We're to live as if we are dead to sin, having, uh, giving no space to the devil, leaving no open door for him to come in. As Jesus said, even going to the cross, because he had walked in obedience, even before his physical death, he said that the God of this age has nothing in him. Satan had nothing in him. I know the devil still has some things in me that I'm dealing with. I, I, I want to be free from it. I'm striving to be free from these things. But if we're not striving to be set free, resisting sin even to the shedding of our own blood, then we haven't truly died in, into the baptism of Christ, into that place where sin has no longer has dominion over us. I'm getting a little tongue twisted here. I'm trying to gather my thoughts. Lord Jesus, praise your name. There are some things in the scripture that make it seem like they're past tense, like it's already been done, and it's just we're just kind of 
I don't know, um, waiting for it to be manifest or something. But there's a working out of these things. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God has said these things, but we have to enter into it. We have to make it real in our lives. We have to, as Peter said, we have to add these things to our faith so that our entrance into the kingdom is abundantly supplied to us, so that these things that he has promised will be manifest. They will become real in us. God desires them to, I believe, but they're not going to actually be manifest Unless we're walking in the way, following Jesus in the path that he has laid before us and allowing us ourselves to actually die to sin and by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So we need to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our relationship to God the Father is through, is, is through Jesus as we follow him. As we walk in the light, we'll have fellowship with him and with the Father. Praise your name. Verse 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you should obey it in its lusts. That's our, That's what we do. This is what we do. Christ died for us so that we are no longer bound to sin. But the choice to either sin or not is entirely up to us, friends. Is entirely up to us. I know, again, it's taught that Jesus died for our sins, past, present, and future, so that whatever we do, we're automatically forgiven if we've accepted the Lord. Again, there's no Bible for that. In fact, Peter says in that passage I was just referencing from 2 Peter chapter 1, um, uh, Peter reminds his readers, he says that you have, you've been cleansed from your past sins. Everything, uh, everything was wiped away from our past when we came to the knowledge, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But now, now we have to walk in it, and we're being tested in it, and we have to put to death the deeds of our flesh. We have to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies by offering our instruments as members of unrighteousness, rather than as instruments of righteousness unto God and holiness. That is our part. That is what we must do. Praise your name. And that's what we're going to be judged on. God is going to judge us more harshly than he judges the world, because we who have been set free and given the opportunity and begun the journey toward the promises of God, we can actually stop sinning. The world can't in that sense, but we can. So if we choose not to take advantage of the, of the life and godliness that has been provided for us and the grace of God and the Holy Spirit to help us, if we do not take advantage of that, of that we're going to be judged more harshly than those who do not have those opportunities. And he tells us, do not present your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as, righteous, as instruments of righteousness to God. Other versions say weapons, which I like, because we, we know that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but is against the principalities in the heavens. We're fighting against them. And we fight against them by obeying God now in our flesh. We're not fighting flesh again, but we're fighting them. But they're, the spirit realm is looking down to see, what are we doing? How are we acting? Are we, acting are, are we being a Christian in the true sense of what a Christian means, one who's like Christ? So we're doing the things that he would do. We're offering our, 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 the instruments of our body as, as, uh, as, as righteousness unto God, doing the things that Jesus would do, viewing the things that Jesus would view, saying the things that Jesus would say. Praise your name. Praise your holy name. And, like he says, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, we can walk in that resurrection power now, having been set free from sin, living that new life unto God, nurturing that seed that is within us, that is going to be revealed in that day. We don't know yet what we shall be revealed. But when we know that when he appears, we shall appear with him. In fact, here, let me, let me, let me read that. I, it's one I know, and uh, I got the NAS here today. This is uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Some of my favorite verses in the scripture. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name. Look at it from the NAS. I usually use the New King James. Um... And this is small. Oh, here we go. Right after Second Peter, we have First John. Here it is. Praise your name. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, 
because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It is not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he, Christ, is, is pure. And John is writing to the saints. He's writing to those who had been baptized into the Father, baptized into Christ, baptized into the death of Jesus. And we're supposed to be living that new life. Praise your name. Those are the children of God. And we know, again, from 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, or is it 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In fact, let me, let me find that. These are important passages, friends. And I know I use them often, but they're becoming increasingly important in these days in which we're living. I fully believe this. Praise your name. Uh, verse 17, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. He's called us to be separate because we've been baptized into Christ, into his death. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I touched on that in some videos and teachings on, on, on the children of God. Because um, it's taught that we're all children of God. But this says differently. And this is those who are going to be the, the, um, the brothers of Christ, of those who touch not what is unclean, who do not offer their members as instruments of unrighteousness, but unto holiness, unto righteousness, unto God. He says, then I will receive you, I will welcome you, and I will call you my son or my daughter, and I will be a father unto you. This is whom he's talking to. These are the ones, and I pray that we're among them. I, again, I count myself as nothing. I don't count myself as having attained anything. I want to be as Paul who pressed in to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, if by any means I may, I may be raised in that first resurrection, conformed into his image. Because I've been walking worthy and purifying myself. Praise your name. Praise your name. I always seem to get off in this direction. Oh, Jesus. It's just, I see so many conditions in the scripture on attaining to the promises of God. We, unfortunately, we teach them as, as, if, as if once we have said a prayer or raised our hand and accepted Christ that all these promises are ours. But they're, friends, they're not. This goes back to the journey in the wilderness. The promises, the promised land was set before them and they were set free from the dominion of, of evil over them. And, and they, were given, they were shown the light on how not to sin. But then they had to walk it out. They had to walk through the testings of the wilderness before they could reach the promises of God. That is the exact same thing with our salvation. Our, our being saved now, we have been saved from the dominion of sin. We no longer have to sin. So God says, okay, now I'm going to take you into the wilderness. Even as Jesus was tested, after Jesus was baptized by John in the, in the, in the river there, and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, he drove him immediately into the wilderness to be tested for 40 days by Satan. Jesus had to come forth having been tested and passing the tests in order to be filled with the Spirit and go and begin to minister life and teach the, uh, the kingdom of God to the people. He didn't do it immediately. Jesus had that promise of being made Lord in Christ and be given all authority and he was driven into the, into the wilderness for 40 days. Even the rest of his life was, was, a, was a continual test as he had to face the um, um, e even obedience up to the cross and all this stuff that went along with it. He grieved over the, over the people of Jerusalem because they would not accept who he was and the things that he was revealing to them regarding the kingdom of God. Israel had to be tested before they could receive the promises. We have to be tested before we can receive the promises. They're set before, we, before us. We can see them in the word. Jesus knew the promises. Israel knew the promises. It was, it, Moses told them, the land flowing with milk and honey, all this stuff was going to be available unto them. Oh, Jesus. So we have the promises. They're set before us. We fix our eyes on him, and we walk that way. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. 
He did not have it at that point. The promises were not fully realized until he physically allowed himself. Like he told uh, uh, um, Pontius Pilate, he could have called legions of angels to save him from the cross. He did not do that. He endured what God had set before him because he knew there was something greater ahead. We know there's something greater ahead. Are we going to carry our own cross, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus? Praise your name. Oh, Jesus. I don't know how I got on all this. How I got on all this, Lord. I pray it's ministering life and truth to someone, encouraging us, Lord, to continue to press in to know you. There's a physical resurrection, friends. These bodies are going to come back to life again. And we're going to be clothed with what we've received, what we've sown to in, this, in the spirit realm. We're going to receive back in that day the things done in our body. And I pray that we're continually nurturing the Christ that is being formed in us. That's what Paul said. He travails in birth that Christ would be formed in us. We have a seed. And I believe it's, it's being watered and grown as we spend time in the Word and fellowship and prayer. And we turn. We repent. We turn away from the things of this, uh, from the temptations of life that are continually coming upon us. And friends, it's going to get, it's going to increase. We've seen an increase in it in, in some areas with the political stuff going on lately, and 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 health things, other other financial situations, other types of things that are testing our faith. My family's being tested in all these areas right now. So what am I doing? I'm 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 spending time in the Word. This is where I get my strength from. When I see the promises of God and the hope that is before us and recognize this is something I need to enter into. I need to be striving towards. I cannot rest comfortably and just assume it's all going to come out in the wash at the end. No, no, no. The day of the Lord comes expected, uh, uh, unexpectedly upon those who are just eating, drinking, buying, selling, marrying, giving a marriage. And the day came upon them as the flood did and it took them all away. That's not a rapture, friends. I know that's taught sometimes as completely opposite of what the Scripture is teaching there. It took them away. Those who were taken away were those who were destroyed. That's what it said. That's what Jesus taught when he's talking about um, what happened with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened in the, in, in, the, in, in the flood. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God will protect us. He'll keep us if we're keeping the word of his patience, if we're obeying his commandments. If we're walking the way of the cross, he'll keep us in the trials and tribulations that we're going to face. But if we're just taking for granted the promises of God, and just going about our business, and just coming to church on Sunday and maybe Wednesday, and a little prayers here and there, but our whole life is not devoted to the things of the kingdom of God, we're going to miss out on that day. We're not going to be among those who are left and in, in, in united to the Christ. Jesus, praise your name. Oh, praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for the promises you have set before us. I pray that we can see them. I pray that you open our minds as you did to the disciples so we can comprehend the scriptures and your promises. We can set them before us and see the promises. And strive to attain to that, as Paul did. Paul said I, he had not yet attained. He knew he had not yet attained all that he had done. Dear Lord, let us not be deceived. Or let us stray by the smooth sayings and the, of man and the ear-tickling messages that come forth so often. That tell us that Jesus loves us no matter what we do. That he's going to continue to rescue us if we fall from the wayside. Jesus said... If you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. He didn't go running after that guy to bring him back. No, he didn't. That parable of the lost sheep has to do with those before we come to Christ. He draws us to himself. And once we're walking with him, we have to stay the course. We have to stay in that narrow and constricted way. If we drift off to the, to the broad path, there's no promise of, of God. Or Jesus, that he's going to go onto the broad path and bring us back. No, we're once we're on the path, that's the path that we're on. We are the ones who need to keep our feet walking in the direction that he has laid. If we find ourselves drifting off, the Spirit will be behind us, telling us. But we have to heed the word. The Spirit is speaking to us. 
We have to fight to stay on that narrow path. Endure to the end the challenges and the testings that come our way. Praise your holy name. That we can come forth as gold tried in the fire. Being made into the image of Christ, conformed to his likeness. Becoming one with him as he is one with the Father. Oh, Jesus. Help us to receive what your word has said, what you have said. Give us ears to hear, Lord, hearts to receive. And a will to obey your commandments, Lord. Praise your name. To delight in your ways. Bless each one, Lord, who has made it all the way through this video. And I pray, Lord, that if any have questions, if any want to discuss things, Lord God, I, I love discussing the promises of God. Encourage us in our faith, Lord. Lead us continually into the light. Provide, Lord, as, as you see fit, the things that are needful for our walk. And let us not be deceived, Lord. Praise your holy name. And be glorified in each home and each heart. Amen.